All right, so I'm going to say a few words here. We're going to watch a video that's going to kind of explain why the, why are the Lutzes here. But I get to share a second. They gave me the mic. So I met Josh and Michelle. It was probably, it's been like eight or nine or more years ago uh, when they weren't married. They were just, they had just actually started dating. Um, and we counseled together at Discover Camp. And, uh, and these guys won my heart immediately because you could tell right out of the gate that they, they were two people who were just all in on God. Like the way that they poured themselves out for the kids that week, uh, the way that we were able to kind of bond and, and sweat and toil together uh, in the mud and in the pool and then the whatever else we were doing. It was just a great week. And it was so evident that these guys just really, their main goal was just, hey, man, whatever I can do for God, I'm going to do whatever. I'm all in. I'm going to go anywhere, do everything. And so I'm sure that this video, I haven't seen the video, but I'm sure this video will reflect that. And if you guys get a chance to talk to them, that will reflect that too. So. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like, like sheep without, without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but, but the, the workers, workers are few. few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send, send out workers into his harvest field. We're Josh and Michelle Lutz, and this summer, we're moving to Springfield, Illinois. We're looking forward to moving our family to the capital of Illinois. We have four children. Our oldest, Caleb, is finishing up kindergarten and will be turning six very soon. Esther is in preschool and will be turning four this summer. Our daughter, Chloe, just turned two. And our sweet baby, Phoebe, is six months old. The church in Springfield was planted over 25 years ago and is made up of over 30 resilient disciples who've called Springfield home for many years. We're encouraged by the support that's been shown by the Midwest Missions Alliance to invest in the Springfield Church. And we trust that God is opening a door right now to impact the lives of many. We're looking for mission-minded brothers and sisters from all stages of life. If you're a college student, young professional, single, have a family, or are an empty nester, you bring value to the church family, and we would love to welcome you into the team. Uh, we're inspired by the examples of faithfulness that we've seen in the Revive EE team, which is focused on invigorating the faith and growth of our churches in Eastern Europe. It's our hope that we'll be able to follow their example by building a team of selfless disciples who will join us as we move to Springfield to strengthen and encourage the church. Replanting your life is challenging, but doing difficult things for God and His kingdom alongside other disciples of Jesus leads to exciting growth and faith-building memories. As newlyweds, Michelle and I went on a one-year challenge in Burlington, Vermont. And without a doubt, that season of our life led to some of our fondest memories as disciples. And speaking of one-year challenges, we're excited to announce that Springfield has been selected as an official one-year challenge site by Disciples Today. We believe God has the perfect people to partner with us in Springfield, Illinois. Please be praying for God to send workers into His harvest field. You know, after Jesus tells his disciples to ask the Lord for workers, he turns to them in the very next chapter and he sends them out. 
We believe that God is calling some of you right now to go with us on this great adventure. So please, be praying for Springfield, and to God be the glory. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning to you online, to everybody in the building here. It is so good to be here. Michelle and I are super excited to be in Minnesota this morning. Uh, we're, we're honored to be here. I'm honored to preach. Uh, before, before we get into the sermon, I just want to give you a brief update on some of the things that Michelle and I have been doing as we're promoting this mission to strengthen the Springfield Church. Uh, we've been encouraged by our family of churches in the Midwest. In the last month, we visited Indianapolis and, uh, and Chicago. Of course, we're here this morning. And then later in the month, we'll go to Detroit and Milwaukee as well. And as we've done these visits, the unity of our Midwest family of churches has been so evident. We have been so encouraged. Uh, really, our unity has been on full display. On Friday, we were able to be with the campus ministry here. That was awesome. Uh, for some of you guys that are here, hello again. Uh, man, it was so great to be with them at that time. And then on, on Saturday, we got some time with the Sherrills and the Allens and the Harveners, and that was just so refreshing for our soul. Also, uh, with four kids, there's not a whole lot of time where it's just me and Michelle hanging out. And so that was, that was so refreshing to us. It's been so clear that we're unified in our mission to seek and save the lost. And that bond is worthy of celebration. You know, I appreciate Lee's uh, comments during communion and his support. Uh, we feel such a kinship uh, with, with the work that you guys are doing in Duluth. Uh, we, we really do. We feel like we're building a friendship now, which will hopefully last for decades and decades and decades as we build our churches into this next generation. And in each of these stops, we've been talking about the Springfield Church, and we've very plainly been looking for disciples who are willing to come with us on this mission. And so I want to give you some details quickly just up here at the top before we get into the sermon on how you can get in contact with us later on. So we've got a couple slides here. Uh, you can visit our website, the Springfield Illinois or Springfield Illinois Church org, and when you get there, there is a link that you can click where you can be added to our mailing list, so you can stay in touch with what we're doing, updates about the Springfield Illinois Church. Uh, also, every Thursday night on Facebook, we're doing a uh, Facebook Live devotionals at, the, at Springfield Illinois Church, and uh, so you can find us there as well. We're doing these short devotionals. We're calling them Springfield Mission Talks, but just really quick, inspirational little messages to keep you updated about what we're doing. Uh, I mentioned in the video, but I can do so again now. You can visit our official one-year challenge uh, website. That's uh, you know something that Disciples Today decides. And if you're interested in doing that and specifically want to know that, about what that is, uh, we don't have time to talk about it now, but you should go to that site to figure out what is a one-year challenge and uh, would that be a good fit for something for me to do. Uh, and then, of course, you could just reach out to me and Michelle directly here in Fellowship, or if you're online, you can uh, say, we're shamelessly looking for people to join us in Springfield, Illinois. So that's why we're here. That's what I, so I got to talk about those de details. Uh, the Midwest churches have such a great history of just standing up and sending people on mission plantings around the Midwest. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our spiritual DNA. Uh, back in September of 2012, the Des Moines church was planted by none other than uh, Beth and Colin Sherrill right here. And uh, I, I believe, if this number's right, 18 uh, faithful disciples from around the Midwest stood up and said, we want to help and we're willing to go. And so we've been encouraged by their example as well. And then last year, uh, Jaron and Bianca Singh were sent to plant a church in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And again, 13 people from around the Midwest stood up and said, we're willing to help. We're willing to go. Here am I, send me. Over the years, the Midwest churches have given a lot. But this morning, as I preach this morning, I want to just ask us the question, are we still willing to sacrifice for the mission? This morning, I believe that the Spirit has put on my heart a message that I think we all need to hear. Whether you'll stay right here and be local in Minnesota, or whether the Lord is calling you today to do something great out of your comfort zone, this is a message we all need to hear. The title of today's sermon is The Joy of the Mission. The Joy of the Mission. I want to read for us a passage today that's going to be our anchor for the rest of the sermon. We're going to keep returning to this uh, throughout the message. 
This verse is encouraging to me, and it's my prayer for all of us this morning. Let's go ahead and we'll read Romans 15, verse 13. Here's what it says. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's enough in this one passage for a whole sermon, so let's get to it. Point number one this morning, the joy of the mission starts with hope. The joy of the mission starts with hope. Did you know that as a disciple of Jesus, a follower of him, you have something that the rest of the world is desperately looking for? You have hope. You have real hope. The world promises that it has viable solutions for loneliness and sadness, for despair, but it cannot provide solutions to any of those issues, Uh, certainly not lasting solutions. Your relationship with God, though, provides you with an alternative to all of the garbage solutions that the world provides. The world says that you will be satisfied if you have power. If you have romantic relationships, if you've got just a little bit more money, if you have the right politics, if you have status and popularity, these things will provide you with joy and contentment, but these are empty promises and they will never deliver. But time and time again, we go back to these supposed solutions, which we feel like should work because everybody around us is saying that they should work, but these things will leave us empty. And somehow, even when we're sitting in that emptiness, we're still convinced that if we just had a little bit more, then things might change. But your relationship with God provides you with a real alternative, and you get to share that alternative with the people who are around you, hurting, looking for solutions. As a follower of Jesus, you have an opportunity to partake in sharing about this secret every time that you open your mouth to talk about our great God. Because we have. A God of hope. Where does true joy and peace and contentment come from? Well, it comes from the God of hope. And grab onto this idea. Hope is delivered by those who are on a mission. Okay? Hope is delivered by those who are on a mission. As disciples, we're on a mission to deliver hope. I've got a little bit of an illustration for you, all right? So, a couple months ago, uh, the Ever Given got stuck. You remember seeing this on the news? You know, and this is a big boat, but not just a big boat. This is like a really, really big boat. Check out this graph. Look how big this thing is. So you can see the Titanic next to the Ever Given, and it's quite a bit smaller. You see that? You've got the Eiffel Tower there, and the Ever Given is longer than the Eiffel Tower is tall. This is a big boat. And it gets stuck in the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal is an important trade route, not just for that area of the world, or not just for that area of the world, but for the whole world. This is one of the world's busiest trade routes. And this obstruction caused a significant impact across Europe and Asia and the Middle East, all across the world. Every day that this boat was stuck, millions and millions of dollars were lost, eventually totaling in just one week $9.6 billion because of this blockage. How did it get so expensive? Well, we're not just talking about the goods that are stuck on that boat itself, but we're talking about the 369 boats on either side of the canal that couldn't get through because this thing was in the way. (laughs) They couldn't waste the time or the money to go all the way around the tip of Africa, so they just sat there and waited. You know, to me, this seemed like a hopeless situation. There's no way that this barge is going to budge on its own. It needed an an intervention. It needed hope. And remember, hope is delivered by those who are on a mission. And so the port authorities and the barge companies and the the local officials, they all get together and they say, we have got to figure this thing out. We've got to get this thing unstuck. Look at this little crane here in this picture. He's like, I'll help. I'll help. Let me just dig out a little bit of dirt at a time. This, This to me seemed like a hopeless situation. And on the surface, it is. There's no end of suffering in sight, and things are getting worse every day. You know, I I think that there are a lot of people out there who spiritually have a barge wedged in their canal. They've got a hopeless situation, and they're like, how do I fix this? 
This is too big for me to overcome. What do I do next? There's no chance of rescue, but this, this thing is not going to fix itself. I've got to do something, but I don't even know where to start. And I think people are in that kind of situation all the time. They recognize their need for help, but they don't know where to turn for hope. They, they say, man, I know I'm a mess. I know there's a problem, but I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. But, you know, brothers and sisters, we know where joy and peace and contentment come from because we serve the God of hope. So, so what, what is hope in a biblical context? Let's talk about what hope is in a biblical context. In a biblical context, hope is a joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. Let me give that to you again. Hope in a biblical context is a joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. Eternal salvation. Come on, can you grab onto that for a minute? Eternal, that means last forever. Salvation, that means you couldn't save yourself. You needed it from some other source. Hope that comes from the God of hope has the ability to solve every problem in your life and in all of your friends' lives, both now and forevermore. The God of hope provides a solution to every problem. And we get to share those solutions with people who don't have a hint of how to solve their issues because we serve the God of hope. And there is joy in being able to to share about the God of hope. That doesn't mean that life's going to be easy or free of issues. On the contrary. But at least we know that there's hope and there's a way to start moving the barge. There's a way to dig out of the mess. Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians. I want to show you just a little bit of the hope that we get to have. And actually, we, sh- we sang about it today in that song, Days of Elijah, in, in the chorus. And, and you'll, you'll see that connection here very soon. So look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll read verse 13 through 18. Paul's talking to the church and he says this, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who has no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus Those who have fallen asleep in him. Remember that song we sang? Behold, he comes riding on the clouds. You know where that comes from? Check this out. This is the same kind of imagery that we're talking about in that song. We'll continue reading in verse 16. It says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Can you imagine just for a moment that scenario? The Lord himself is going to come down from heaven. The dead in Christ will rise first to be with him. And all the disciples who are left will will meet him in the air. As Christians, we do not grieve like the rest of mankind who has no hope. When we die, we don't die a death like everybody else. At the end of our lives, we get to go and be with the Lord forever. And as we live, we live as those who have received salvation from our sins, which means that we're not spiritually dead either, but we've been made alive in Christ. The alternative is to be dead spiritually while being deceived by the world about where true joy is is found, all with the promise of pain and hell at the end of our futile wandering. But we get to provide the answer of hope. We're not those that grieve like the rest of the world who have no hope. I want to go on to my second point this morning, that the joy of the mission is defined by trust. The joy of the mission is defined by trust. It starts with hope, but it's defined by our trust. Let's go back to Romans 15, that verse that I started in, and I want to read it for you again now that we've talked a little bit about hope. This is the next part. So Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. Second point, joy of the, joy of the mission is defined by trust. You know, it's really hard to trust in God when it's so easy to trust in ourselves. It's very easy to trust in ourselves, and that makes it difficult to trust in the Lord. But when we do trust in Him and not in ourselves, then we're able to be filled with joy and peace and hope. But that only can happen if we trust in Him more than we trust in ourselves. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about trust for a little while. I want to just uh, have some, some time for vulnerable sharing with you, all right? Some vulnerable sharing about me and Michelle and our life and just where we're coming from. So in December, uh, Michelle and I were having our regularly scheduled discipleship time with Tracy and Phyllis Lahr, who lead the Champagne Church. And uh, as we've all come ac become accustomed to, this is a Zoom meeting. And so we're just on the call, you know, shooting the breeze, talking about the normal things that we would talk about in our marriage and in our parenting and in the campus ministry and the church and just kind of what's going on. And then all of a sudden, without warning, bloop, bloop, like other people join in on the call. <laughs> and it's, it's A.T. and Marcy Arneson who lead the Chicago church. And A.T. and Marcy are on all these different committees and uh, leadership teams across the Midwest and in our family of churches. And my immediate thought is, oh, shoot, I'm either fired or maybe we're going to have to move somewhere. <laughs> and I'm like, but probably fired. I don't know. And, and, and then so, you know, we're, we start talking and, uh, and the Lars and the Arnesons begin to explain, hey, there's a need. There's a need in Springfield for a ministry couple. We need, a, you know, some staff people to go there and to serve in Springfield. And we think that maybe you guys could be that couple. And th then they, you know, they reached out to Springfield, of course, and said, hey, we've got a couple. They might be a good fit here. And we start the formal, you know, interview process. And now, fast forward, we're here this morning, today, talking about Springfield. But I just wanted to share with you for a couple moments where we were at as we, you know, received that call. And then through the holidays and through January, as we're thinking and being interviewed, just some of the thoughts going through our mind, because this was not an easy decision. We started to immediately think through all of the things that we would need to leave behind if we said yes. Because we could have said no, but we chose to say yes. We, we recently bought a house in Champaign. Here's a picture of our house. Actually, this very moment, it's being shown to people who uh, potentially want to buy it and so that we're praying through that situation. But we, bu we bought this home together. It's our first home together. Uh, we're coming up on nine years of being married. This is our first home. This is our kids' first home. Uh, thanks to a big hailstorm that happened in Illinois in 2019, we got a brand new roof and a brand new siding. Insurance covered the whole thing, and, and, and we were just like, awesome. We can live here for another 30 years and not have to think about a roof. It, so it's a bi level. So uh, we've got you know the upstairs and the and then the basement. And in the basement, there's these two big rooms. And on one side there's a playroom, and on one side there's a family room. And between two, the two rooms, there's this staircase, and underneath the staircase, there's this closet space. And I just thought to myself, here's another picture. If I just cut a hole in the wall, then I can create this awesome clubhouse underneath the stairs for our four kids, just to to make use of this empty space. And so. Caleb and I worked on it together. We put in hardwood floors. I got some shiplap on the wall. I put a light in there, stained glass. It's the perfect little clubhouse for the kids in the basement. We got Caleb tools for Christmas so that he could work on it with me, and he built it with me, you know, my little five-year-old. You know, I've spent hundreds of hours in the backyard uh, working on the backyard, making it be exactly what I wanted it to be. We built a roof for this play set in the backyard. That's, what, that's my daughter and, and my son. We, we're, we're working on this stuff together. The next picture, I think, is uh, us just repairing this broken down play set and putting this new roof on it. And we eventually got it to this space where it's just the perfect little play area for them in the backyard. And it's everything we wanted it to be. We just refinanced our, our mortgage last year, got an awesome rate, went down from a 30 year to a 15. We like the schools. We like the community. Caleb goes to a school that's three blocks away from where the church building meets. Esther goes to a preschool called We Disciples Preschool that meets in a church. Well, like, how perfect could that be? And, I, and then I, we start thinking about not just the house or the community that we love, but we start thinking about the Champaign Church. 
We start thinking about, man, this is where all of my friends are. This is where all of my relationships are. This is where all of my kids' friends are. I, I, what's the next picture here? Got a, uh, the softball team. We got a softball team in Champaign, and I, I manage the softball team, and these are my buddies. And we play in the community, and, and man, I, I'm so refreshed on a Monday night when I go and play softball with the guys, the disciples of Jesus. You know, we think about the campus ministry, and in the last six years, we've had 40 campus students get baptized in the Champaign campus ministry. And so many of them have stayed right there in Champaign. I've done two weddings. I start thinking about, man, these are all these relationships that we're going to leave behind. You know, all these, all these connections, man, we feel at home here. We put down some roots here. I love this group, and I don't want to go. When we moved to Champaign, Caleb's just two months old, and now we're a family of six. All of our daughters were born in Champaign. This, home, this place has become our home. And Caleb and I dreamed of making a, a tree house in the, you know, 150-foot tree that's in our front yard, like 200-year-old tree. We're like, man, we're going to make it all these dreams. And we got to a point where I just, I just cry for all the things that I might lose. But then here, of course, comes the, the pivot in the story. Because when I really started to think about it, and I stepped back for a little while, I said to myself, you know what? This is all going to be all right. Because I know that when I trust in him, and not in myself or in my own plan, then I'll be able to be filled with joy and with peace and with hope. But that's only if I trust in him. And you know what? This is actually what I've always wanted to do. I believe that I've been called by God to do this. And there are people in my life all around me that I love and respect and look up to. And they're telling me and Michelle that they believe in us and they think that we can do this. And of course, we have our insecurities and we question ourselves and we think, can we even really do this? I don't know. And there's some days where I struggle to believe it. But I know that if we trust in him, then God can and will use us in a great way. But that's only if our hope is rooted in him. And if we're trusting in him and we've got people around us that we look up to and we love and we respect. And they're saying that they believe in us and they think God can use us to serve in this way. How could we possibly come back to the Lars and the Arnesons and the MMA and the, the Midwest core leadership team and say, you know what? Actually, I really love my backyard. And so I'd rather not engage in the mission of the kingdom. You know what? I, I put in a hardwood floor and a closet in my basement. And so you know what? Really, that's very important to me. Come on. How short-sighted would we be to not take the message of the kingdom to a city that needs that message? Amen. You know, I, I started to think about Mark chapter 10. Verse 17 to 31, it's the story of the rich young ruler. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this story, but I want to talk about that for just a little bit. So let's read, starting in verse 17 of Mark chapter 10. It says this, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him to keep the commandments. And the rich young ruler responds, Hey, I've kept all of these commandments my whole life. I have been a good guy. I've been doing all the right things. And Jesus looks at him, and he loved him, but he knew the man's heart, and so he gave him this challenge. Verse 21, he says, One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And now Jesus is speaking this guy's language. This is a rich guy. You know, it seems to me that this guy, is, this guy probably worked for a lot of what he had. His identity was tied up and tangled up with his wealth and how he saw himself. And Jesus looks at him in this moment and he says, one thing you lack. There's one thing that you lack. Jesus pinpointed that the rich young ruler wasn't willing to sacrifice his wealth. Why? Well, let's just think about this for a minute. So what does wealth do for any of us? It starts off as a tool, right? It's just a tool, but it's a tool that provides security. And the more of it that we have, the less it seems that we need to rely on anything other than ourselves. So this guy, in a great way, had given in to the idolatry of wealth and was trusting in that more than trusting in God. 
You know, I, I think, though, that when we trust in him and not in ourselves, that's when we're really able to be filled with joy and with peace and with hope. And real joy and peace and hope, they only do come when we trust in him. Let's pick up in verse 23 and read uh, a little bit more of this. Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and they said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them. He said, with man, this is impossible. But not with God. With God, all things are possible. And then Peter spoke up. We have left everything for you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields or a big oak tree in their front yard, or the play area that they built in the basement, or the schools that they like, or the hometown that they love, or the familiarity that makes them feel safe, or the place that you thought you would retire, or the fill in the blank for you. What is it for you? Because this is a long list of things that get in the way that provide some idolatry instead of Jesus being Lord. What is it for you? Well, I will go this far, but there's no way that I would go that far. There's no way I would move to Duluth. There's no way that I would, whatever it is for you, fill it in. Or are you like Peter who said, hey, we've left everything that we have to follow you. Have you left everything that you have to follow him? This guy was a good guy. He followed all of the rules. This wasn't somebody who didn't come to church or uh, he just blew stuff off. Like, this guy did the right things. He, but, but he wasn't willing to let his stuff go. And so are you. Are you willing to let the stuff go? The comfort, the things that you've worked for, the things that you now believe you deserve and that you really believe that you need. Are those the things that you've convinced yourself that you need more than you need to trust in God? You know, what? I, something I think is pretty crazy is that every single one of us in this room we live more comfortably than that rich young ruler. Just, just be, because we live where we live in the time that we live, we all live with more creature comforts than the rich young ruler. I mean, just talk about indoor plumbing. That's it. I, I mean, even just that, you already live more comfortably than the rich young ruler. But, and I think that we can sit in judgment of the rich young ruler and say, well, yeah, yeah, he didn't do it. But, I, it, it, man, if I was talking to Jesus, I would. W would you? Look at the emotion that this guy has in verse 22, right? Because this, this guy, he had an emotion. And what, what did it say when he went away? Verse 22, at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. But when you give up everything and you embrace that the only way to have real contentment in this life is through a lifestyle of sacrifice, that, then that's, that's when you find real joy. The result of sacrifice will always be joy and an increased amount of trust in our Lord Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the joy of the mission, it starts with hope. It's defined by trust. That brings us to my last point. The joy of the mission is empowered by the Spirit. Let's read our primary passage one more time to really lock this thing in. Romans 15, 13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. Overflow, isn't that awesome? You'll overflow with it. You can't even hold it in. How? Why? By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fuels this whole thing. You won't overflow with hope just because you want it really badly or because you feel some kind of immense guilt or anything else. The only thing that will lead to this kind of power and transformative change in your life is the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I love uh, Romans chapter 8. Let's go turn over to Romans chapter 8. This is the best place to go, man, to talk about the Spirit, uh, to, to really just understand how this thing is at work. We'll look at verse 1, and man, if you're ever feeling down, I would just say turn over to Romans 8, and we'll read verse 1. What is the Spirit? have the power to do. Let's talk about it. Verse 1 it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ 
Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. If you're sitting in this room and you're a disciple of Jesus, there is no condemnation anymore for your sin. You've been set free from the law of sin and death. And that is always something worth celebrating. You've been set free. You know, but there is a problem, brothers and sisters. That there are so many, so many who have not been set free from the law of sin and death. It's a law that they live by, they breathe by, eat and sleep by. It, it's every day for them because they have not yet been set free. You know what? That's really sad because the Spirit, there's people that don't have the Spirit, but the Spirit is our counselor. The Spirit is our guide. The Spirit is an advocate. The Spirit is a deposit which guarantees your inheritance in heaven. But some people don't have the Spirit. But people need to know about the Spirit. Some people have been going to church their entire lives, but they could not point to you in the Bible where it says how you even get the Spirit. Lots of people know about John 3.16, but they don't know about John 3, 1 verses 15, which say that you need to be born of water and the spirit to be reborn they understand some concept of god's love but they don't know how to be transformed by the spirit which is the true power some people don't know about acts 2 and the beginning of the church they don't need they don't know that you need to trust in jesus sacrifice and actually repent of your sins and be baptized to be washed away of those sins to receive this great gift of the spirit there is something this is something that we have got to all have deep convictions about because this whole thing is powered by the Spirit. It cannot be powered by you or how hard you try or anything else. It is the power of the Spirit working inside of you that will lead to transformative change. There is power in the Spirit. So we have got to go out and we've got to tell people about the Spirit and how to stay in step with the Spirit and to live with the Spirit. This is a great secret, and we cannot keep it to ourselves. Look at verse 9. It says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. You are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. For a little while there, it talked about the realm of the flesh, and I'll give you the abbreviated version. You don't want to be in the realm of the flesh. <laughs> you would rather be in the realm of the Spirit. Let's keep on reading. It says, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And the, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of, because of the spirit who lives in you. Do you, brothers and sisters, do you think about what that verse just said very often, that the same spirit which took a dead man and raised him to life again is the same spirit that lives in you and helps teach you to say no to ungodliness and stay in step with the will of God. That is tremendous. It's amazing. And by what? It's all by the power of the spirit. And it, it leads to a necessary response that we all must have if we understand this message. Look at verse 12, and it gives, us, it gives us an answer of what we're supposed to do with all of this. Verse 12, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Hey, if you want to live life, that is really life. If you want to live a life that's really full of joy, you've got to be living day in and day out by the Spirit. And I, brothers and sisters, I know that this has been a weird year, 16 months, whatever. There, there's, there's no way we could have expected to go through the, the last year and a half that we've gone through. Uh, some of the campus students maybe remember, but we had a, a New Year's Eve party, a Midwest-wide New Year's Eve party that we hosted in Champaign, Illinois to ring in 2020. And I, sta I stood in front of 250 campus students in the Champaign Church of Christ, and I said, you know, campus brothers and sisters, 
2020 is going to be the best year ever. If only I could have known. <laughs> and in January, you know, we, we're, we're there right in the beginning of January and everybody's hanging out and having, you know, high five and having fun. If only we could have known. Wait, man, we know that it's been a weird year. We know that it's been weird. But, you know, I think that this last year has led to us all getting a little bit more comfortable. This last year, uh, we all have kind of gotten into ourselves a little bit. And whether you go to Duluth or you go to Springfield or, or you just stay right here, we all need to be revived in our spirit to live out the mission. There are people that you work with. There are people that are going to be, like Lee said, coming out of their hibernation caves that are ready to hear the gospel message. And we need all of us to be recommitted to the gospel message. To the mission. We've got to save some souls. We've got to partner with God. We've got to go places that we didn't think that we would ever go. We've got to talk to people that we normally wouldn't want to talk to. We've got to get a little bit uncomfortable. The rich young ruler was not willing to give up his comfort. But as a follower of Jesus, you've got to be willing to give up your comfort. We've got to be willing to do the things that we did not think that we would do. Because when we said Jesus is Lord, we meant it. We meant it. I know that you did. You wouldn't have said it if you didn't. And when we live out this message, we get to bring hope into people's lives. And then we will be living a life overflowing with peace and with joy. To close out, the joy of the mission, it starts with hope. It is a message of hope. It is defined by your trust in him. And you know it's got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, if you're feeling called by God to join me and Michelle in Springfield, then amen. We're excited to partner with you and to go on this great adventure together. And we hope that you'll reach out to us soon. But if you stay right where you're at, we still all need to recommit to the mission, which is a mission of joy. Amen. Thank you, Josh, just for a fantastic lesson. Thank you for doing such a great communion. Um, just from that lesson, uh, Josh, it just reminds me of what is most important in life. Um, you know, I think all of us know somebody who's gone on a mission field. I mean, my wife went to Cleveland. That's where she and I met. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, but really what's most important to us uh, is really being able to live by the Spirit, uh, to really hope and trust in who God is. And honestly, um, that's just the most important thing is just really having that great relationship with God. Thanks again, Josh. I do have a couple announcements for us uh, before we close out in prayer. Um, this Wednesday on Zoom, we'll have our third session of the Bible and Gender. Um, so please look forward uh, to the Zoom link in the Realm announcements. Also, uh, Fiesta Latina. Is that right, Gilbert? Yes. That's going to be Saturday, May 29th, beginning at 11 a.m. Uh, I think it's Moor Park, M-O-I-R. Down in Bloomington, that's uh, 10320 Morgan Avenue South. So uh, I'll close this out in a prayer, and then we'll be dismissed to fellowship. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you just so much for giving us the opportunity to be able to gather together this morning uh, to enjoy the fellowship of one another, God, but to really uh, be able to praise you, God. Thank you for uh, just really bringing us all together, for holding us together, God. Uh, for all the, the blessings that you give us in this world, um, and just really watching out for us, Father. I do, uh, I really like that song where they talked about that one line, just having the reckless love for each and every one of us. Thank you for all that you do, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.